Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. And uh, my name is Erin Harris. I am the chief editor of Cell and Gene and host of Cell and Gene, the podcast. And thank you for being here for Ending Cancer as We Know It, the Game Changing Potential of Cell and Gene Therapy. Uh, my esteemed panelists have already been introduced and really need no introduction, but uh, Dr. David Scadden, he is the director of Center for Regenerative Medicine, MGH and Gerald and Dorleen Jordan, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and Dr. Ned Sharpless, former director of the National Cancer Institute. We have a lot to discuss, so we're just gonna get right into it, but I do encourage you and invite you to uh, submit your questions via the app. Um, I may not, because I don't have the iPad, I don't think. If that's okay, we have a lot to cover. So <laughs> <laughs> if you have questions, let us know. All right, so um, we're here to discuss whether new treatment innovations have us at a turning point to end cancer as we know it. Uh, that is a, a big statement, and so before we get to the no those new innovations, let's uh, set the stage a little bit. And so I want to ask uh, my panelists here for their perspectives on their future of cell and gene therapies as they apply to the cancer space and the non-malignant space. And so, Ned, I'm gonna ask you first, what needs to be solved in the cancer space to get us to uh, solving cancer as we know it? Yeah, th thank you for the question. I, you know, um, by the way, that, that expression comes from President Biden. He said that's his goal is to end cancer as you know it, a very exciting goal. Obviously, the National Cancer Institute was thrilled and found this very galvanizing to have the President of the United States talk about this national campaign to really change the American experience of cancer. It's, it's wonderful to hear, and I think something we would all support. Uh, but once you hear that goal, you have to start thinking about how we know cancer as a country and what does it mean and what, what do we want to change. Notice the president did not say he wants to end all cancer, eradicate all cancer, which you know, probably wouldn't be biologically possible anytime soon. But I think we can change the national experience of cancer in a very direct way. So one of the things the president has talked about is reducing cancer mortality on the order of 50% in 25 years. So going from 146 deaths per 100,000 Americans today to about you know, 73 uh, in 25 years a bold but I believe achievable goal. And uh, when you start thinking about it in those mortality terms, you realize very quickly there are some things you can do that will make progress towards that goal and other things that are less useful. And so, you know, really viewing things of the prism of reducing age-adjusted mortality, uh, therapy is important. It's an important part of that along with prevention, early diagnosis, screening, and the other parts of the cancer armamentarium, ending disparities, for example. And uh, within therapeutics, you know, we, we sort of think of, uh, you know, a couple of modalities. We have surgery, that's pretty old and it works, but not for everybody. We have radiation, we have uh, chemotherapy, classical cytotoxic chemotherapy, and more recently, immunotherapy. And now within that immunotherapy bucket, we have now added, uh, to some extent, cellular immunotherapy, this new, you know, these living drugs, if you will, that Carl June and others are, are gonna talk about more. And it's very, very exciting, but it has brought up a lot of challenges for us. And, and in no particular order, I would say those challenges are doing clinical trials in the space is very complicated. So we've seen a real promulgation of single institution studies. Looks like this thing works. It's for some cancer. It's better than some historical control arm. But you know, to use those kinds of data for regulatory decision making is impractical. Uh, the costs of these trials are very expensive. So there's a lot of manufacturing issues that mean doing such studies is, is complicated. And uh, then there are just a bunch, a bunch of weedy things like if you make the CAR-T at one institution and it gives, it's transfused at another institution, who's got the medical legal risk there? And there's an indemnification problem one has to solve, for example, and on and on and on and on and on, because it's a whole different way of taking care of patients with these autologous products. And so then there's this hope that off-the-shelf allogeneic products could be uh, the solution, but that has a separate set of challenges. So I think it's a really exciting time. We've seen decades of progress against cancer. We have this administration that's committed to accelerating that progress uh, we have these promising new therapeutics, and it's you know our job, th this community, to figure out how to do that. Thank you, David. I'd love to hear from your perspective. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I look at it more in uh, breaking it down into solvable entities um, based on really what the patient experience is like. So, um, this is an, an area where uh, we've actually been using cell therapies for decades in, in blood cancers, where cell transplant really started. And frankly, that's also where uh, Carl June's spectacular work on using cell therapies with mature cells, T cells, has also been able to really demonstrate its power. Uh, and in those circumstances, I think if you 
view it from the perspective of what it's like to experience that, there are a couple of different problems that become immediately evident. So one is what Ned referred to of the issue of if they're your own cells, you have to wait for those cells to be ready. And our ability to culture cells, to have them be a, a uniform product that has reliability and we don't have to go back to the patients and say, this usually works, but in your case it didn't. Or you have to wait and the period of time is so long that your disease has relapsed. So I, I think that's an area that um, in some ways really encapsulates what something, something that I think is a, a larger problem that you've referred to, Ned, of how do we make sure that our ability to generate cells is as efficient as possible and as uh, uniform as possible, something that I think we're, uh, we just heard uh, Peter Mark speak to uh, at another session. Um, but I think it also it raises this issue of are we going to ever get to a point where we can get away from the bespoke product from the individual? because that will enable us to have, A, a much more uniform product, and also something where we won't have that long delay of waiting. Um, the other issue, I think, is for people who are receiving these cells uh, back into the body, we do have to condition them. That is, we have to provide them with a medicine or a radiation uh, approach that depletes many of the existing cells, and that's it's something that we think of as it's a necessary part of the process, but it's not trivial for the patient. And I think there are ways in which new technologies can be applied to that. And full disclosure, I'm involved in a company that's working on that. I think other elements of this are, um, are we going to be able to overcome some of the issues of persistence of cells, which the good news is with the CAR Ts and the blood stem cells, those are cells that have the capacity to re reproduce themselves and becoming, become a living therapy. But I think some of the other cells that are now becoming a part of what we use are cells that will exhaust. And our ability to, in some ways, outfit them with the capacity to be sustained is a critical issue that we need to continue to work on. And in particular, um, the things that we've now seen as that CAR-T has initially provided for us is the idea that we really can provide cells with new types of capabilities by virtue of genetically modifying them. And that really, I think, opens up the door for us to really start to expand our way of thinking about it as not just leveraging an existing capability of the cell, but really providing the cell with some degree of superpower so that it has more of an impact. Good, okay. I just want to let everyone know I do have the iPad, and so if you have questions to submit for our panelists, please feel free. We will try to get to them. Uh, I want to touch on the topic of non-bespoke or off-the-shelf therapies, which both of you have already alluded to. So it's a major issue that needs to be settled and um, because it applies to both cancer and non-malignant disease. And we want to talk through the merits of truly personalized or individualized therapies, as Dr. Marx uh, spoke of them today, uh, versus off-the-shelf therapies. And so autologous immune cells have both clinical and uh, economical disadvantages, and we want to talk about the non-bespoke off-the-shelf side. So, Ned, I'll start with you. Yeah, maybe I ought to clarify the way I think about this, because there's really three things. There's um, CAR T cells, which are, I guess, bespoke in the sense that the autologous cells, the cells come from the donor and are unique to that patient, but the, the, the drug, or the biologic in this instance, is the production process and the lentivirus or retrovirus that transduces it. So it's not regulated through a bespoke pathway the way, the way other things, you know, like a cancer vaccine, a neoantigen vaccine, or uh, you know, some of these personalized, truly individualized medicines that are out there. And then there would be the allogeneic uh, CAR T cell that would be off the shelf that could be used in multiple different recipients with regard, you know, with matching for various, you know, immune antigens and, and, and whatnot. And I, I think, you know, the bespoke word I've been kind of using for those vaccines and things. So, you know, I, I don't want to, and that's a really difficult problem, uh, not what we're talking about right now, but I think a, a, a very challenging regulatory framework where I don't think the FDA has really solved that. And I, I love the FDA, and I was acting commissioner of the FDA, and I will say I don't think the FDA solved that topic. But CAR T cells, autologous CAR T cells are simpler, right? They, they, they are approved products. Uh, there are more coming. Uh, clearly, this technology works. The real challenge there is it's extremely expensive and takes a long time and not everybody has great T-cells and, you know, a lot of manufacturing issues. Uh, but, you know, my, my belief is um, 
making a expensive effective therapy cheaper is a lot easier than when you have no effective therapy and trying to invent an effective therapy. So I have every confidence that autologous production can be improved. Uh, but it would be great, I think everyone would agree, that an allogeneic product that one could use in everyone, uh, or at least uh, you know, maybe MHC-restricted way in, in, in a variety of donors, um, or recipients rather, uh, would be really terrific to have. And that requires, I think, solving some specific immunological challenges about you know, what, how do you have to engineer those cells so that they won't exhaust and they will not recognize the host, and that, but they will still kill the tumor. Uh, and is very, very exciting technology. I can tell you, when I was at the National Cancer Institute, and I've been a, a citizen again for like two days, so uh, <laughs> recent, re recent arrival back into uh, private life, but you know, we um, appreciated that there was a real problem in the autologous space. So we actually started creating networks uh, through a variety of mechanisms to try and fund autologous studies, first at single sites, and then, you know, even though basically the first day I got there, I wanted to create a multi-site network for CAR T cells, the uh, funding announcement for that just came out, you know, a few months ago. So it took us years to plan an, a, a large network. It's called CanAct, and the submission opportunities are coming soon for those of you in academia. But uh, you know, that that funding opportunity was years in the planning to figure out how to do autologous manufacture at a network of academic sites that can enroll patients at different places. So you know, the NCI is very invested in the autologous side. But uh, obviously, uh, the allogeneic side, I think, is very promising and interesting as well, and certainly bears watching. Anything to add, David? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> first of all, Ned, congratulations on getting that together. <laughs> that is really spectacular. It's going to be enormously powerful. Um, you know, I, I think one of the elements of using iPS cells, uh, these induced pluripotent stem cells, which can become immune cells or can become other cell types, uh, the great advantage of them is that they can be grown essentially indefinitely, but also they're very easy to genetically modify. And there is, of course, a number of different, uh, there are companies that have been developed with the idea that they can become allogeneic by virtue of modifying their ability to be recognized by the host's immune system. I think in cancer it's particularly challenging because we have to depend on their having robust immune capability to do what they need to do and yet to not have uh, to be rejected immediately by the host. Um, I, I think that is an area that is um, something that does require a lot of academic uh, heavy lifting for a long time before we get there. But um, just to frame it in terms of one of the issues that we deal with with that is that if you make cells that are no longer recognized by the immune system and that the host cannot reject. And one of those cells becomes a bad actor and takes on the characteristics of a cancer cell, which in some ways is what we select for when we're expanding up all of these cells, that uh, we may really get ourselves into a problem of not having a way of uh, dealing with cancer, but actually a way of creating cancer. So obviously this is something that is an extraordinary balance that needs to be uh, maintained. I will say I think uh, some of the approaches, and again, disclosure, I'm involved in the company doing this, is to try to identify whether there are dispensable portions of the immune profile that can allow the system to still require matching and therefore still retain function, but reduce it down. And one of the things that uh, I've been struck by, actually, is that if you look at the National Marrow Donor Registry Program, which is a resource that I hope all of you know about and would take advantage of, which is that you can become a donor for someone who needs a stem cell transplant to save their life, that uh, people who sign up for that uh, will get their HLA types characterized. And among those individuals, there are a number of people who do not have who are homozygote deleted for uh, deletion for a particular MHC locus. So they do not have what we think of as a critical component of all of us in our immune system. They can actually be without it. And yet they come in without any recognizable immune deficit and without having a medical history that would suggest that they are in any way compromised. So I think maybe getting some of those experiments of nature now turned into ways in which we can leverage that to enhance our ability to come up with perhaps a suite of cell types that become a resource for then subsequently developing the cell therapies that can be useful for a range of different donors, though they won't be fully a universal donor. Uh, I want to sprinkle in a question that we got from the audience here. Uh, what is the progress on avoiding graft versus host with CART-T? And I would open up to either one of either to take that. 
I presume this is allogeneic CAR T cells. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there is no, it's my limited understanding, we'll ask David, who's more expert, but there, I don't think there's graft versus host with an autologous product, right? There, there's not typically, yeah, uh, not right, so. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I think, what David was alluding to. If you try and, uh, if you can CRISPR-Cas out the MHC locus or, you know, some of the killing proteins in the T cell, you might be able to decrease the uh, toxicity of the allogenic product. That's clearly the hope. Uh, I'm sure David follows this field more than I do. It doesn't look to me like um, it's quite there yet. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think one of the big issue, bigger issues in some ways is the fact that we have people who are uh, getting such vigorous reactivity, not so much to the host uh, normal tissue, but to the host tumor, and result in the cytokine release syndrome, which has been a real issue for people. Uh, that looks like the newer modifications of the, the CAR-Ts, which I'm sure we'll hear about from Carl, uh, will have an impact on, but that still remains a problem, that the experience of going through this therapy, while it can be essentially the court of last resort that can often give people a cure, uh, is something that can sometimes put them in the ICU. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, moving on, I wanna talk a little bit about the regulatory perspective um, under the umbrella of ending cancer as, as we know it. Um, what needs to be done to improve both non-malignant and cancer therapies to, to bring them to market sooner? Um, and my real question is, what are the gaps that still exist uh, in regulatory oversight that require clearer guidance? Ned, I'll start with you. Hmm. I mean, I think, uh, so we, I, I alluded to this before, but I, you know, if you're really talking about like a cancer vaccine, a personal, a truly individualized neoantigen vaccine that just that patient has and nobody else has, that in principle is a, a viable product. Uh, we, we think the science there is very strong that these sort of personalized vaccines will work in cancer and should work in cancer, but the, uh, there's sort of no pathway to that. If you think about that, the person doing the trial has to do a single patient IND for that patient and there's never an NDA filed and there's never a product. Uh, so uh, I think that that's a serious challenge for uh, the cancer vaccine field at present. You know, the, the idea that there would be shared tumor antigens that would work in lots and lots of people is pretty old in oncology and to date really hasn't worked out. So private antigens are the way to go, but the regulatory challenges to that pathway are uh, serious. Uh, when I was at the FDA, uh, I think we put out something like five guidances related to CAR T cells, uh, I'm sure Peter spoke about this, on you know, manufacturing standards and how long you have to hold the cells for and lot release and these kinds of things. Th that is an area where I think some clarity has been provided, but I still hear from my colleagues who run you know, GMP facilities that it's quite onerous, that uh, you know, lot release in particular has become a real challenge, very expensive testing is required, it delays infusion of the product, and so I think you know, advice from the FDA, specifically around autologous CAR T cells in that space could be useful. Uh, you know, I, I am not really sure what the challenges are around allogeneic products. That's sort of untested. Until somebody goes through that, it's hard to know where the landmines are going to be. But I expect that would be a simpler pathway, potentially, than the other things we mentioned. Mm. And some of those trials are ongoing. Yeah, yeah. You know, with the IPS derived NK cells. I think one of the other areas that, and maybe you can comment on this, Ned, as well, is that the uh, use of materials and a, accompanying a, a vaccine. Uh, or combinations of, of biologics and materials. I, I, you know, I'm involved in a project like that. Uh, I, those are still, I think, somewhat uh, unconventional, and uh, regulatory paths for those can also be uh, somewhat complicated. So uh, clarity about uh, who one speaks with in advance to really have a sense of what the CMC needs to look like and with whom you'll be interacting early on would, of course, be very helpful. But. I yeah. have to say, I, I think the FDA has done a great job in, in, in cell and gene therapy world in terms of partnering with investigators. Yeah, I, th I think it does bring up an interesting discussion that's going on within the FDA right now about, uh, you know, the, the FDA exists in these very powerful centers. So, yeah. so, spoiler alert, the FDA commissioner does very little, I found when I was <laughs> FDA commissioner. <laughs> he signed a lot of press releases. But the center directors, you know, Janet Woodcock, the, Jeff Shuren, Peter Marks, et cetera, extremely powerful with the FDA, uh, but they're kind of siloed. And so in cancer world, uh, an experiment was tried create, you know, at the request of Congress, the 21st Century Cures, Cures Act provided funding for the Oncology Center of Excellence run by Rick Pazder, and it sort of tried to merge things across cancer. And uh, from the cancer perspective, it's been very successful, I would say, although I'm not sure that is the uniform verdict within the FDA. There are concerns about centralization. You know, so why don't we do this in cardiology and neurology and everything else? 
But uh, my, my, my sense is that that is working pretty well, and particularly in these areas where they're kind of combo products, where mm -hmm. the device, you know, the diagnostic and the drug go together, that would normally be a mess, but you know, because of the Oncology Center of Excellence, that's relatively straightforward to coordinate. I think that could be very important in cellular immunotherapy uh, in, in the future. Traditionally, most of OCE's business has been in c dur uh, not c burr but I, you know, I think that's changing. Okay, I want to, in the last few minutes here that we have, I want to make sure that we touch on the, the actual new innovative personalized treatments that we're, we're talking about here, that we're spending this entire summit talking about. And so I want to hear from both of you, what does hold real promise? In other words, what is the next wave of cell therapy, what have you, to bring us toward ending cancer as we know it? Well, you know, I think the thing, the wave we've been waiting for for, uh, you know, years now is the strong striking activity in solid tumors. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I still don't uh, understand exactly why uh, these therapies that are so spectacularly successful in hematologic malignancies have limited activity in solid tumors. Uh, I think that's a scientifically solvable problem that feels to me like we're a couple of RO1s away from, you know, breaking that open and really making progress. Uh, there was some data presented at ACR in uh, midline glioma from Stanford and that looked really good to me that I thought looked quite interesting, the first solid tumor data that I've seen that I got kind of excited about. So I, I think that's the, the thing we need to figure out. It's probably not one thing, but a, a constellation of things about solid tumors that make them unfavorable for, uh, you know, these killing lymphocytes to come in. But I, I believe that will be a solvable problem. And, oh, by the way, the CANAC thing I mentioned is solely solid tumors, right? It is, it is uh, mm -hmm. only for solid tumors because that's the NCI believes that's the uh, problem that we need to solve. Hematological malignancies seem uh, further along. And I, I absolutely agree with that. I think one of the areas that um, we've learned about the tumor microenvironment from solid tumors is the contribution of many different cell types. And uh, whereas the access of T lymphocytes to hematologic malignancies is more the nature of the tissue in which they reside, that's not the case in these other tissues. And so getting a better understanding of the organization and architecture of a tissue, which I think really does bound, not just the tumors, but the metastases and the influx of mesenchymal, of uh, non-mesenchymal cells is, is going to be really important. Um, one of the things uh, I think we are only beginning to explore is the fact that uh, the innate immune system plays such an important role in being able, uh, in modifying that environment. And so we're starting to see the evolution of cells that are based on monocyte macrophages. And uh, while some of those small molecule efforts to approach those cell types have not been very successful, I think them as a therapeutic under them, uh, unto themselves is something very interesting and worth pursuing. I, and I do think, again, those cells are ones that are extremely phagocytic, so it's a possibility that we can actually modify them in vivo rather than having to do a lot of ex vivo expansion. And we may be able to modify them in complex ways that gives them both more uh, capability of getting into a tumor and also being able to elaborate molecules that are relevant for changing the dynamics of the currently immune suppressive tumor microenvironment. Okay, uh, that concludes our fireside chat with Dr. Sharpless and Dr. Scadden. So thank you for your time today. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.